The demands of following Jesus are great. He shows us that sometimes we must make extraordinary efforts to move in a new direction. As we consider the health of humanity, we cannot ignore the need to heal the very planet that sustains us. We live in increasing chaos of a beleaguered environment and the hoarding of resources. We want to be saved by something or someone else, but we discover this week that we are in the boat with the one who shows us our power to turn it around, to calm the storm, and that by his guidance and his power, he draws us toward that particular direction. We protect the jewel that is our home, restoring and something that is beautiful from scars from the past. Let us pray. Life-giving God, in the beginning you created this universe with the phrase, let it be. And the waters and dry land, the sky and the creatures were formed. You set humanity among these wonders and invited us to care and honor all things. We have not successfully answered that call. Seeing the abundance as a feast that would never end, we have taken more than we could replenish at a rate that could not be sustained. We are beginning to comprehend the magnitude, beginning to see that things cannot just keep going as usual 
without having dire consequences. We are frightened, which is partly why we are slow to accept it. But we now are witnesses to the forces of a world more broken than when we inherited it. Water, wind and wave, fire, drought, and earthquake that signal it is time to pay attention and to make real change. Too often we think there is nothing we can do, that the change required is too great. It all feels overwhelming, so we look away, sometimes even from the small things that could make a difference for our own community. Help us, Lord. Show us our ability to chart a different course. Empower us to do so. Forgive our inaction. Move us to move one step at a time toward greater care for one another. And in this silence, we sense and acknowledge our yearning for wholeness. Know this, Jesus asks us to do hard things, to make changes, knowing that we are capable. Jesus promises to walk with us through those changes. We can change in order to heal this jewel planet called home. The calm of Christ in the storm is ours. It is available for you for me, and for all. A reading from Matthew's Gospel. Now when Jesus saw great crowds around him, he gave orders to go over to the other side. A scribe then approached and said, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Another of his disciples said to him, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. And when he got into the boat, his disciples followed him. 
A windstorm arose on the sea, so great that the boat was being swamped by the waves. But he was asleep. And they went and woke him up, saying, Lord, save us. We are perishing. And he said to them, Why are you afraid, you of little faith? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a dead calm. They were amazed, saying, What sort of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? If you're at all familiar with California, you perhaps know the beauty of the mid to southern portions of California, particularly in Santa Barbara County. And perhaps you're also aware of a place that's nestled in the Santa Inez Valley, a picturesque little town called Solvang. Solvang is the result of an immigration move on the part of Danish Americans who, quite honestly, made the decision to move west and in the southwest, particularly because they got very, very tired of the very cold and brutal winters of South Dakota. And so a group made their way in the early part of the 20th century to settle in the valley and purchased 9,000 acres of land in that area and established this community. If you've never been there, you really must go and visit it. It is not only picturesque, but it has also reshaped itself in order to be a tourist attraction for those who would like just a little flavor of Danish culture in this country. But for people like me and my husband, who are interested in looking at churches wherever it is that we go, we landed very specifically on the Lutheran church that is in Solvang, Bethania Lutheran Church. It has the exterior look of a mission church that would be very common in California, but inside it has a particular character to it. If you look around, you see the beauty of wood carvings all around. But what really stands out is the fact that right smack dab in the middle of the nave is a wooden carving of a, of a sailboat. I'm going to, I'm sorry, Eddie. I'm <laughs> just, blah, blah, blah. let me try again. I'll start again. If you know anything at all about South Central California, specifically Santa Barbara County, you know something perhaps about the Santa Inez Valley. In that valley is a charming little town called Solvang that was created and populated by Danish American immigrants who quite honestly moved west because they really became weary of the hard and cold winters of South Dakota where they had first settled. They came to the area they purchased 9,000 acres in that particular region, and they established this town as a way of perhaps retaining their cultural expressions of Danish life in a new land, in a new country. I hope that you have opportunity someday to go there and visit, and perhaps many of you already have. The town itself has been shaped and replicated as a quaint Danish town. But for people like my husband and I, who tend to be church geeks, imagine that, we were interested in looking at the church. And of course, if Danish people are moving to a particular area in this country, especially at the turn of the last century, the early days of the 20th century, they were interested in establishing a Lutheran church. And so became Bethania Lutheran Church in Solvang, California. Now, the exterior of the church looks very much like the mission style that you would expect to see in South Central California. But inside is a beauty and a wonder of the depth of dark wood carvings throughout the nave and all the way up and into the chancel. But the thing that makes this church stand out, at least in my memory, is that hanging from the middle portion of the nave is a ship, finely detailed and carved, beautiful ship, which is in fact a reminder, perhaps not only of the difficulty that it took 
for all immigrants to come to this land when travel was not easy and most immigrants came in steerage passengers, passengers, but also the fact that the symbol of the church itself is also represented in a ship. This isn't just a cultural piece. This harkens all the way back to Noah's Ark and has carried forward all the way through the Hebrew scriptures and on into the New Testament as a symbol of how the church functions and lives and carries out its mission within the world. Some have referred to the ship as the Ark of Salvation. I prefer to think about it as a representative image of how it is that the church in all ages, in all generations, navigates its way through the world in both calm and in treacherous waters. Of course, the term nave comes from the Latin for a ship, and so that imagery has been retained over the years, especially as we also approach these early years in the 21st century. So we meet Jesus today in the boat, and we find that the boat is also a large symbol for the gospel writers, especially Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the synoptic gospels. When Jesus enters the boat, those who heard those words the first time understood that the boat was representative of the church, of the gathered faithful. And oftentimes, Jesus would transport in a boat from one side of the Galilee to the other. We also know that the Galilee is a shallow lake, and because it is shallow, when windstorms kick up, that creates a moment or two or five of chaos in that particular region. Shallow lakes often create much more tumult than what one would expect. So the disciples find themselves in the boat and Jesus is sleeping and suddenly one of those storms kicks up and they are afraid that they are going to sink. But Jesus gets up and he stills the storm and tells it to be at peace and then turns and calls the disciples to task and says, why did you have such little faith? The image is important for us as well. If you've ever been on a cruise, and I know some of you have, if you've ever been on a ship or on any kind of a sailing vessel, you know that when the waters are calm, all goes well, but it doesn't take much to create turmoil. In those moments of turmoil, the imp Inclination would perhaps be to head to the closest and the safest place. And yet that is not the calling of the church. In the midst of a storm, the church is called to maintain its equilibrium and to navigate the storm in order to stand forth for people who might otherwise be afraid in the midst of difficulties and also be a representation of God's grace and God's sustenance and the sturdiness of God's convictions for the sake of God's people. It also is a reminder of our responsibilities to the creation, that in a world that is oftentimes rife with our irresponsibilities with regards to the creation, that we have a responsibility as well to maintain our engagement with the world, to be advocates for the creation and all of its inhabitants. And so as we find our way through the mission field, as the Church of Jesus Christ, we then also are called to hold the main and to maintain our steadfast presence in the midst of calm and also in the midst of chaos. Jesus calls us to us and also promises to be with us in it. Let us pray. Healer of our every ill, especially our fractured creation. We come before you to make our petitions known. Hear our cries for healing of body, mind, and spirit. We know that already you are at work among us, showing us the way to wholeness in the midst of the brokenness and grief of our time. You remind us that you are in the boat with us in the midst of difficult times. We give you thanks for this path of following you, even when you call us to cross over from one way of life 
to another. We pray especially for all who are impacted the most by dwindling resources. We pray that we will continue to learn and see and know how our actions affect others and not just ourselves. We give thanks for the wake-up calls that our young people are sounding, and we pray that for the fortitude to move this journey forward alongside them. We give thanks for the courage of activists and educators who help us wake up to this storm and to see that we have it within our power to calm it, to restore the Earth's wholeness. We ask for courage and insight. Most of all, we yield to your grace and we pray for a spirit of discernment to reevaluate how we as a church can join this effort now and in the future. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now go with confidence that we can face the storm as long as Jesus is beside us in the boat, recovering our depth of love for all and our joy for living in this beautiful, beautiful world. May the words of Jesus ring in our ears. Follow me. And may the Spirit hover, move, and bring healing to our souls. Amen.